Okay, let's go ahead and get reconvened. We still have a few people coming in, I know. So, so now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Kristen John, who was another one of the fellows in the program from 2009 to 2013. Um, she's currently a NASA postdoctoral fellow at NASA Johnson Space Center. So you're going to see, actually, it's an interesting thing to follow on Paul's talk from this morning. So we're now going to shift gears into talking about asteroids, dwarf planets, and two weeks in a box, which people were asking her, what does that mean? And she said, wait to the talk. So I think we'll all be <laughs> very intrigued. Um, she had her Bachelor of Science from University of Texas, Austin, and a Master's and her PhD from Caltech. So with that, I'll Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you'll have to wait kind of towards the end to find out what, what I mean by two weeks in a box. So I'm trying to capture you guys with an interesting title. So, um, so yeah, I'm Kristen John, and I was, uh, I think I was with the, the second group of fellows that came into the program. So there were no um, alumni when, when I started, I don't think. I think maybe the next year there were. So I'm at NASA Johnson Space Center, and I'll talk to you about what I do um, as a postdoc and kind of how I got there and uh, all the kind of random activities that, that go on as a postdoc at, at JSC. Okay, yeah, so I was a fellow from 2009 to 2013, and my discipline or field of study was properties and materials under extreme conditions. Um, so I did my practicum in the summer of 2011 at Lawrence Livermore National Lab with Bruce Remington and Heisuk Park. Oh, thank you. Um, and although I was at Livermore, I actually spent most of my time in, at the University of Rochester um, using the Omega Laser, uh, the Laboratory for Laser Energetics, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. Um, and the focus that summer was on strength of tantalum and strength of iron. So this is my, um, oh, actually, so one thing I, I always like to joke uh, with this fellowship, if people ask, how did you get this fellowship? And I said I was able to say DOE, NNSA, SSGF uh, out without, without stuttering. So, and so the same thing for grad school, for those of you who haven't defended, to actually get your PhD, you just have to be able to say the name of your dissertation title without reading it. So it's now been a few years, so I, I have to read it. But um, <laughs> so, so I actually am an aerospace engineer, so that I'm different than most of the fellows here. Um, so I'm not, not a physicist at all. Um, so all my degrees are aerospace engineering from UT and then from Caltech. Uh, and I worked with Ravi Ravi Chandran. So I was actually the first in at least our group at Caltech to start working with Livermore. And so we've kind of opened up a relationship there and they continue to do work um, of the similar kind that I did. So this is just kind of a, a one, one chart on, on what I did in grad school. So I can sum up four years in, in one slide, which is kind of exciting. Um, so basically, we, we studied at Rickmeyer Meshkoff instabilities. So we have the, um, these little targets have ripples on them, and we would impact them with the omega laser and watch the ripples grow and correlate that to strength. So that, that's, that's pretty much what we did. So, and then I, back at Caltech, a professor named Michael Ortiz has a, a code called Eureka that he's been working on for over a decade. So one of my jobs was actually to validate the code and the experiments um, by running simulations that uh, compared to the experiments. Um, and this was just kind of another slide that I grabbed from my uh, defense uh, talk. It's basically what, what the applications of my research were. Um, so, you know, fusion energy is kind of the exciting one, but lots of other applications too. Um, but mostly what we were looking at was, was strength of materials, material properties. Okay, so what am I doing now? So I'm, um, I'm at NASA as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, and it's part of the NASA postdoctoral program, or NPP. Um, so the, my so, I'll talk, so I've, a week from now will have been a year, my year anniversary as a postdoc. So I'll talk to you about what this last year has been like and kind of what a, a day in the life of the postdoc is like, but it, um, no two days are the same. Um, and just to give you a little history on how I got to NPP, so I was getting towards the end of this fellowship and uh, my Krell funding was actually ending, and so my advisor and I kind of used that as a, as a date to try and get done with my thesis, which actually worked out. Um, and so I had a, a opportunity to go to NASA because a um, Paul Abel, who I work with, came to, to Caltech and talked about, actually, Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. And I thought it was really interesting. And I wanted to go back to Houston. That's where I'm from. And so I, I pursued that. And um, after a few applications through the MPP uh, and some government shutdown delays, finally made it work. So I actually I had a few months off uh, from when I defended to when I started, uh, which was actually really nice. And for those of you who haven't started working yet, I recommend that, definitely. Okay, so um, I'm in a group, the, the planetary science group at Johnson Space Center. And as I said, I'm an engineer. So I'm, I'm an engineer among all scientists, pretty much. There's about five engineers in the whole group. Um, and then that being said, we're also the one science group, pretty much, within Johnson Space Center. So you probably think of Johnson Space Center, it used to be called the Manned Space Flight Center. So everyone's all about human space flight. Uh, but then we have our little group. We're kind of the, the outcast there at, at JSC. So, so within that group, I'm, I'm you know, one of the, the few engineers, and, and within Johnson Space Center, we're kind of the outliers. 
Um, so it's actually interesting. I kind of like that because I'm, I don't do the same thing as everyone else, and I'm, I'm kind of unique and um, can, can use that to my advantage, I think. So. OK, so uh, one of the reasons um, I am where I am in this postdoc is to kind of bridge the gap between the science and the engineering. So we, they needed more engineers in our group, and um, they need people to be able to communicate with the scientists um, across, across the different disciplines. Um, so I actually have two advisors. So one's, one's an engineer who's, who's had a lot of experience, and another one is uh, Paul Abel, who's the lead um, scientist for, for small planetary bodies. Um, so Paul Miller and I actually were, at, on Monday, I just heard him give a talk here in, in DC at the Small Bodies Assessment Group. OK, so this kind of ties in what Paul was talking about earlier today. So I won't go too much into asteroids, because you heard a lot about that this morning. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about, about how I'm involved with asteroid research. Uh, so because I work with Paul Abel, who's the, the kind of the asteroid guy at Johnson Space Center, I try to get involved in anything asteroid related that I can. So uh, two of the missions, which you've heard reference, one is AIDA, another one is ARM. And AIDA, I mostly just sit in on some telecons. I haven't contributed much, but I'm hoping to. Um, ARM, I've actually helped contribute um, different surface properties during research on what's, what's been done in the past, what we know about other asteroids that we visited, or what we think we know, um, and then kind of proximity operations, what we're going to do when we get to the surface. So just a quick tidbit on each of these. So AIDA is the Asteroid Im Impact and Deflection Assessment. So Paul mentioned uh, DART, which is the NASA mission. So it's Double Asteroid Redirection Test. So what they've actually done is they've combined this NASA mission with an ESA, the European Space Agency mission, um, called AIM, which is Asteroid Impact Mission. So basically, um, AIM is the asteroid rendezvous spacecraft, and DART is the actual asteroid impactor. So they're going to go up separately, but they're going to work together. Uh, so that should be really interesting. And, and as Paul said, they're going to Didymos, a uh, binary system. Um, OK, and then there's the Asteroid Redirect Mission, or ARM, which you may have heard about in the news. It gets a lot of press. Um, and so they actually are going to, most likely going to be utilizing the gravity tractor um, planetary defense technique, which should be, should be interesting to see. Um, so the, the kind of very high level objective of ARM is to visit an asteroid, uh, redirect its trajectory, in this case using a gravity tractor, and then bring a boulder off the surface and put it in a lunar retrograde orbit. Okay, so um, one of the things that we do in our group um, on uh, we have a couple meetings each week where we basically brainstorm and we do mission concept development and we kind of come up with ideas on what kind of missions could we do, how could we get the scientists in our group involved. So that's uh, something I really enjoy at my job. It's kind of neat. Uh, so it's not, not necessarily funded to, uh, to do any of these missions. It's more like if we had money, what would we do? Um, and we're hoping one day someone will come and give us money. So um, kind of a hot topic lately is uh, Ceres, Dwarf Planet Ceres. So I'll talk a little bit about that just because I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in this body. OK, so I won't go over this too much. You guys probably know what asteroids are. Um, so we, we have asteroids close to us, near-Earth asteroids, which are the ones of, of interest for planetary defense. Um, they're also located in the main belt. There's Trojan asteroids located at Jupiter and, and near almost all the planets, um, and then the Kuiper Belt objects. OK, so uh, is Ceres a dwarf planet or uh, an asteroid? That's, a, that's an important question. So all of us here, of course, remember Pluto when it was a planet. OK, so this is the definition of a, a dwarf planet. So it has to orbit the sun. It has to have enough mass to assume a nearly round shape. Um, it has not cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, and it is not a moon. So um, this is kind of shows you the, the list of, of the current dwarf planets in our solar system, or how we define them. So Mercury is not a dwarf planet. That's just for scale. OK, so in 1801, when Ceres was discovered, it was the first discovered, because um, it's the largest. Um, but we defined it as an asteroid, and it still kind of is an asteroid, but really refer to it as a dwarf planet, and it's very different than all the other um, asteroids. But what we're also learning is that all the dwarf planets are very different from each other, all the asteroids are different, and the, the definition uh, between asteroid, dwarf planet, even between asteroid and comet, there's kind of a fine line there. Okay, so Ceres is located in the main belt. It's the biggest object there. It's not that you know, scary looking, but that's just to, to give an idea of where it's at. Uh, and to scale, that's about how big Ceres is compared to the moon and Earth. And this is a chart I use all the time when I'm talking about asteroids. So these are asteroids that we've visited with spacecraft. Um, and so, you, so I was wondering, you know, we never see Ceres or Vesta on this, this chart, and I wondered why. And so I went to the, uh, the Planetary Society lady who has a blog who puts this together and found out why. That's because Ceres is, is that big. So compared to all the other asteroids that we visited, 
um, it's, it's uh, difficult to put that to scale. OK, so how big is Siri? So I'm from Texas. So it's about the size of Texas. So that, that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, OK, so as you know, Dawn is at Ceres right now orbiting. Um, so this was the resolution with Hubble before we went to Ceres. This is the resolution now. And this is actually a couple weeks old, so it's better than that even. OK, so uh, one Cerurian day, I'm not sure if that's how you say it, is nine hours. And a year is 4.6 years, or 4.6 Earth years. It's the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system, which makes it a really interesting target. And it's close by, which is nice. And it's the biggest body in the main belt. Um, it's also um, named for the uh, Roman goddess of agriculture, which is the same word that cereal is derived from. So next time you're eating cereal in the morning, you can think of Ceres. Um, OK, so you'll see this image here with the infamous white spots, which we're learning more and more about uh, as we get closer and closer. OK, so here's just kind of the temperature of, of Ceres, some information relative to all the other planets. So it's not. Not too bad. So what's it made of? So we're learning more. Uh, we hope to learn more with Dawn. Um, but we believe it's a C type, so it's carbonaceous. So we think there's volatiles there. Um, possibly a high salt content, uh, definitely water there. Um, uh, icy crust, for sure. OK, so water plumes. So the Herschel Space Telescope, a few uh, years back, discovered uh, these plumes that were coming off of Ceres. So that's when we knew, OK, there's definitely a, some sort of liquid um, water, ice, something going on there. And now that we're getting closer with Dawn, or now that we've gotten there with Dawn, we see these white spots. And so if you ask the Dawn team, what, you know, what are these white spots, you won't get a, a good answer, basically. So, and this is actually some words I took from their website. So until we get a closer look, it's anyone's guess what these spots could be. So I think literally every day, they're, they're giving us more and more information. But um, it's definitely some, some sort of you know, ice-filled crater, ice um, water exposed. OK, is Ceres habitable? Uh, so I actually work with um, some astrobiologists, so they, they like to talk about this sort of thing. And there's actually some meteorites that we found um, that have halite in it that basically there's some, some hand waviness going on. But, but there's definitely some possibility that, that there were some, some meteorites that could have been delivered to another body that eventually came to Earth um, that, that could meet these criteria. So it's possible that, that Ceres was habitable at, at some point. OK, um, so why Ceres? So we don't, we don't know a lot about it. Um, it's, it's kind of an asteroid, kind of a dwarf planet, but it's, it's different than any other body we visited. Um, so we, you know, there's a lot, lot to learn about it, and it's an icy world nearby. So the icy world community wants you know, samples, and they want, they want more information. So this could be an interesting target for them. Um, so I like to push the potential mission to Ceres, which is a little controversial sometimes, because usually we're all about Mars. But, um, you know, Ceres is close. It's actually, it's, it's got some benefits to going there. So we could do a rover, a lander, manned or unmanned, um, and sample return, which would be really exciting. Um, so we could go there for exobiology reasons, definitely get history, history of the solar system, um, or utilize it for resources. Um, and if you look at, at kind of the, the surface of Ceres and, and how you would get to the surface and get off the surface, it's actually pretty friendly for, for spacecraft. So this is kind of the, the list of, of potential human targets you always see. So I think we should add Ceres to that list. And, and I think you will. I think you'll start to hear more about it, um, as you probably have been in the last couple of months. Um, and the, this is just a quick slide on the Dawn spacecraft, which is there right now. OK, and so Dawn also visited Vesta. So this is just a, a quick chart on kind of the resolution of what um, Vesta and Ceres look like with Hubble and what, what we get now. So again, it's even better than that. And um, so NASA has deemed 2015 as the, the year of the dwarf planets. So I just want to put a little plug in there for, for Pluto as well. Um, so mark your calendars for July 14th, because that's when we'll get some really cool images of Pluto. Um, and so this, again, just shows the, the resolution we have before New Horizons. New Horizons is the name of the spacecraft going to Pluto. Um, and this is the type of resolution we can get. And so with. With that um, same kind of resolution, if that's what we looked at in the solar system, if we were looking at this, what would you think we're looking at? Mars, OK. Same thing here with that kind of resolution we had of Pluto. That's what Earth would look like. And so here's kind of my thought for what Pluto is going to look like when we get there in a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, okay, so that's it about, about uh, Ceres and dwarf planets. So again, I don't do, um, I'm not part of the Dawn team. I'm just interested in Ceres, and I think that now that Dawn has visited, there's definitely potential to, to do more there. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. Hopefully in the next couple years, you'll see, see more happening there. Okay, so uh, most of my time is actually spent doing experiments on the space station or trying to get experiments up onto the space station. So that's why I'd say I spend 75% of my, my time actually working on. So here's just a picture of the space station orbiting the Earth, and there's a picture of, of one of the, the um, modules from the inside. So it's very very crowded, but we're ho hoping to add a few more things there. Um, okay, so you probably guys are all aware of what happened this past Sunday with SpaceX. So it's definitely disappointing. Um, and I've always you know, been interested in, in watching SpaceX and orbital sciences succeed, but now even more so because I'm relying on them to get my experiments to a space station. So it was definitely disappointing, but um, even the attitude just this week through emails, I can see people are just moving forward and, and carrying on. Um, and then it, it kind of reminded me of this quote, which is sometimes overused in the space program. Um, and obviously this is in regards to the Apollo program, uh, but I like this quote especially because it was said in, in Houston uh, in the 60s. So, I, you know, it's definitely a, a setback what happened to SpaceX, but, you know, space industry is not easy, just as nuclear science is not easy either. So I think we can all kind of relate to this, this kind of problem. That's why we do what we do, because it's, it's hard work and it's interesting and, and uh, we're challenging ourselves. Okay, so um, some folks high up in the space station program decided it needs to be easier to get science experiments uh, to the space station more quickly, and the space station has a, a finite lifetime, so it's, it's good that they're finally realizing this. So in the background there, I just put a few charts to show these are, these are the deliverables that we have to, have to get as far as integra integration to get your, your um, payload safe, safely to the uh, space station. So there's a lot, of, a lot of work, so you can see why I spend a lot of my time uh, working on, on this type of stuff. Uh, but it's, it's exciting that we get the chance to do it. So I have two, two experiments that are now funded to go up on the space station. Um, and each of these projects are basically worked by three people total. So I'm one of, one of the three on each of these teams. So it's a small team, very small budget, um, but we have the approval and, and we have a slot on a launch vehicle, which is exciting. So the first one is DNA sequencing in space. Uh, so again, I said my background is aerospace engineering, so I don't know a ton about DNA sequencing and everything I learned, I've learned in the last couple of months. Um, but basically, we're sending a, a, a small off-the-shelf product. It's a DNA sequencer that's smaller than it's ever been before, which is why we're able to do this. And um, basically, we're just gonna test it in microgravity and, and see that it functions the same that it does here on Earth. Um, so why do we wanna do this? So there's lots of reasons. So definitely, um, we can monitor the environment on space station, um, look for any sort of uh, bacteria or mold that might be growing there. Um, there's research opportunities, uh, medical operations, um, and then we, one of the people on our team is an astrobiologist, so we definitely have some um, interesting ideas for the future of, of DNA sequencing, um, not just on space station, but on future, future missions. Um, let's see. Okay, so the benefits to in-flight sequencing. Basically, um, you, can, you can do this real time. You can do this on the space station. Right now, the uh, microbiology capabilities on space station are less than that of a high school or even a junior high. So they, any samples that they take, they have to bring back down. They can't do anything up there. So uh, with, with sending a DNA sequencer up there, now they could do a lot more on station than they could before for a pretty, pretty simple effort. Um, and so it reduces the down mass. They don't have to send samples back. They can do real-time analysis. Um, and as we go to further, further away destinations, this will be critical. And again, astrobiology, science investigations, uh, which, which we're interested in. Okay, so this is what it looks like. It's this little thing right here. So it's smaller than your iPhone. Um, so it, it basically uses uh, nanopore technology. So it can do DNA, RNA, and protein sequencing. We're just sticking with DNA sequencing for now because to start simple. Um, and we'll be the first to, to do DNA sequencing in space, which is pretty exciting. And it's uh, getting a lot of PR at Johnson Space Center, which is exciting. So even the, the center director there has talked about us to the, to the whole, whole center, which is exciting. So, um, so yeah, there it is. It's called the Mini on the device. Uh, it's 120 grams. It's just a few inches long. And it's powered by, a, it's powered by either a laptop or tablet. We're sending a, a tablet just because it's already certified or it's being certified to go into space. And that's a, a big part of it is using things that are already allowed on station. Um, so this is kind of the, the technology that it uses. So um, right here you have these little, this, these nanopores on this, this is called the flow cell. So you have nanopores right there. And so you just insert your, 
sequence. And so the nanopore is basically just a, a really small hole, um, but it has a, an, an ionic current that passes through the nanopore and measures the current um, as it passes through, and basically we get a readout of the DNA. Uh, so the, the neat thing about this is you can sequence anything. You don't have to know what you're sequencing before. So some of the other technologies um, in microbiology, you kind of need to know what, what you're sequencing. Here you could take any sort of sample and, and get a DNA readout. Okay, and this is just kind of our, what we call the concept of operations or CONOPS in, in the space program. We use that a lot. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with these, but it's basically just a pretty picture that shows all the, the steps um, to, on, on how this will work. So we launch the item. We have to stow the, the samples in cold stowage, um, and the crew will come. Were, and, and one of the critical things is making sure that the crew doesn't spend too much time on your experiment, that they don't have time, basically. So, so you have to minimize that. So the crew comes. They thaw your sample, which our sample is so tiny it takes like a minute to thaw. They connect our device to the tablet. Uh, they inject the sample. They throw away the, the empty syringe. And then they, they let it run for 48 hours, then then come back and put the computer away. And, and we're learning how to do Wi-Fi on space station, so our data will magically appear to us, which is great. Um, and they save the flow cell, because we do want that back, stow the device. And we'll have them do that whole process three times with three different samples. And then eventually, we'll get, get the flow cells back. So that's pretty much it. But because we'll have the data downlinked to us, we'll get the data right away, which is really exciting. OK, so the other um, experiment that we have going up is basically to study asteroid regolith on the space station. Regolith in general, but mostly we're interested in uh, for the purposes of asteroids. OK, so what is regolith? Um, so I'm not sure how familiar you all are, are with regolith, but basically it's the, it's the fine particles, the dust that you find on any sort of airless body like the moon or asteroids. Um, so it's, it doesn't have a biological component, um, otherwise we'd call it soil. Um, so it's dry. Um, it mostly has sharp-edged grains, um, and it's held together by microgravity and different, different forces happening there. Um, so it's really not a lot like what we have studied on Earth. And, um, and we haven't been able to study this in space for more than all we've actually studied this for is 30 seconds at a time on a bunch of uh, microgravity flights, parabolic flights. So this hasn't been studied for more than 30 seconds at a time. So um, you'll, you, you'll read a lot about the Apollo astronauts kind of complaining about regolith and, um, and how it, it smelled like gunpowder and, and has, they're not sure about the health hazards. Um, and it, it kind of it destroyed a lot of the different um, equipment that, that went up for Apollo. So these are just some quotes by um, some astronauts and people that worked on the Apollo missions of how uh, detrimental it was to all the, the equipment and the spacesuits. Uh, so this is, for future exploration, this is something we have to really understand. Okay, so, um, so we know even less about the mechanical properties and the behavior of regolith, which is what we're interested in studying. Um, so we want to, and, and one big thing for future um, missions to asteroids, manned or unmanned, is how do you actually attach to the surface? So there's very low gravity on asteroids, so you need some way to actually anchor to the surface. And so as you uh, probably saw with, with the mission to a co the comet a couple months ago, back in the fall, and then again when the Japanese went to an asteroid a couple years ago, uh, we don't have a great success rate in attaching to these small bodies. It's very difficult. So we have about a 50-50 success rate of successfully attaching to these small bodies. Um, and so we're interested in how the regolith compares to the actual bulk composition. Um, and we're interested in, again, just the physical properties. What's the strength, the hardness, the size distribution? How deep does the regolith go? So this is what our experiment is called, strata, because we're studying the stratification of the regolith uh, in microgravity. So this is just to kind of catch people's attention so they, they see that this is an important thing, especially at Johnson Space Center. So we're all about the, the astronauts and the crewed missions there. So if they want to send astronauts to, uh, to any sort of small body, uh, airless body, we need to understand how to cling to it first. OK, so these are kind of the objectives of our experiment. Uh, so basically, it's, uh, it's the initial experiment, but we're hoping to send up a facility that we can use for future investigations to study the fundamental properties of regolith. Um, so we're starting with how, how it behaves in microgravity, and we'll provide uh, fundamental data that will be used for models. So a lot of the stuff Paul was talking about, we're interested in different properties. This type of data could actually help, uh, help with those models. Um, we want to understand how, how um, easy or difficult it is to anchor to a spacecraft in regolith and uh, how it interacts with different um, equipment. OK, so this is just a CAD model of what our payload will look like. So we're in the process of building it right now. We've actually ordered the aluminum extru extrusions already. And we have a, a Texas A&M is actually building our electronics box. So it's all happening right now, because it's supposed to be ready by the end of the year, basically. So, um, so we're sending up four transparent tubes. They're transparent. We just put the colors so you can see it better. But they're transparent so you can see the material. And then we have four 
cameras. They're kind of like GoPros. Um, they're called Hack HD, but um, and those were will monitor each of the tubes, and we'll we'll basically image these simulants in um, uh, time lapse kind of fashion. And um, they'll be in a vacuum. We'll put have them in vacuum before we send them up, and then we'll uh, restrain them so that the regolith isn't moving upon launch. And then we'll restrain it again when we bring them back down. And it's completely passive. This time around, we're trying to keep it simple. So it's really just a camera looking at the, these tubes filled with regolith to see how, how the different particle sizes um, distribute and how they, they move. Uh, so we're hoping in future experiments, we can do more active experiments. So these are kind of our main science questions for strata one, which is what we're calling this experiment. We're hoping they'll be strata two and strata three as well. Uh, so how does the regolith evolve under microgravity and ambient vibration? And so we're using the, the space station as our kind of environment to um, simulate, we've got, we'll have high frequency and low frequency uh, vibrations. We'll have the docking of different spacecraft with the space station. We'll use that to kind of simulate you know, impacts on an asteroid. And we'll be up there for a year. And we are, um, kind of our controls is basically particle shape and, and particle size this time around. Uh, this, these are actually the, what we're putting in the four tubes. We finally decided we have, we have about 13 scientists that are actually on our team. So people are really interested in, in this uh, research. Um, so we, we make that clear to the space station program that this is actually a very interesting topic. And we have people from universities all over the country that are interested. And in, they were fighting over what, what to put in these tubes. Uh, so to start, we basically have one, one tube is filled with a, just a meteorite, an ordinary chondrite, um, ground up. And then another one, we wanted to do a carbonaceous chondrite, but carbonaceous chondrites have carcinogenic material. So of course, that's, that's not allowed. Uh, so we have a professor, Dan Britt, at UCF is creating his own, he has his own formula for a carbonaceous chondrite that's not carcinogenic. Um, and then the last two will basically be glass beads. So they'll be three size distributions. And um, one will have rounded beads, and the other one will have the same size distribution, but they'll be sharp, sharp edged, fragmented beads. So again, there's just kind of a picture of, of the layout of what it looks like. So the volume, so it's not, it's not too big. It's 16 by 19 by 11 inches. Um, and we picked that volume because it fits in, in the little place nicely in Space Station. They're still deciding where to put us, but, but um, we're designing to make it as easy as possible for them. Um, so we're, what we really want is kind of the best micro-G environment to represent an asteroid, the surface of an asteroid. So there are actually different um, levels of micro-G of, of gravity within the space station, uh, but they have what they call, a, I think it's called the micro-G ellipsoid, but um, so there's certain locations that we would rather be. And so one of them is actually the Japanese module. So that's where we're hoping to go. So they're probably going to stick us right in there somewhere. Um, and we'll have an accelerometer package that will tell us what accelerations we're exposed to. Uh, so there's just a, a picture of one of our tubes. These, this is some testing that we're doing right now at uh, UCF, University of Central Florida, with the, the tubes trying to figure out the right lighting and, and how, how much to fill them. And there's the, the picture of our camera, which is pretty tiny. Um, so we have to do all sorts of testing. So um, because this is supposed to get science experiments to station more quickly, there's no rules on. Um, they don't, they basically, they don't care if, if your experiment succeeds or fails. They just want to make sure it's safe to the crew and safe to the vehicle. So it's kind of up to you to do the test to make sure you're, you're um, successful. So we're, we're doing some, some vibration and structural testing to make sure that upon launch, our, everything kind of stays in place and, and our experiment will succeed. And of course, making sure it's safe for the crew and the vehicle. Um, and uh, I won't go over this, but basically, we're hoping for future experiments here. So um, these are kind of some of the science questions that we've thrown around, and engineering questions as well, like how to anchor to the surface. Um, sample return is a big thing. How would you go grab a sample? Um, so if anyone has any ideas, feel free to come up to me afterwards and let me know. OK, and this is, again, just our kind of concept of operations for Strata 1. So we'll launch the assembly. We'll install it in some designated location that we'll hopefully find out about soon. Uh, the crew will come um, set it up, which is basically um, it doesn't take much to, to set it up. Basically, they just plug in the power and, and attach it somehow. And then um, the, it'll operate autonomously. So we have the electronics package, the code written in there. It'll actually take the pictures by itself. And then um, the crew only has to come every three months and take out the SD card and, and downlink the data. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Then at the end, they'll uninstall the tubes, at least. We're trying to decide what pieces we want brought back. But at a minimum, we want the tubes brought back. And then they'll stow the hardware for return. Um, throw away everything else, however they, they do that. Throw it out the window, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, return what we want. So that's pretty much it for that. Um, so let's check my time. OK, so um, last, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, 
analog missions. So you know the, the asteroid redirect mission and the AIM mission and these are those are real missions. These are analog missions. Is basically us going to other locations or doing other things to to simulate a space environment. Okay, so NEMO 20. So you guys may have heard about the NEMO missions. They usually do pretty good PR, but basically it's the underwater studies. So I've been fortunate enough to be on the team for NEMO 20 to study, um, to help, help get ready for this mission. So they're actually going in about two weeks. They're sending a, a four-person crew um, down by, in the Florida Keys underwater. And, um, and this one's actually really interesting, and one of the reasons we're involved is because they're simulating a variety of, of um, surfaces and gravity levels. And so they're actually simulate. They'll have like an asteroid day and a Phobos day, Phobos and Deimos day, and and Mars days. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and they're also doing uh, communication time delays to represent if they were on Mars, they'd have some sort of calm delay. Um, so we helped kind of develop what what kind of things you would want to do on an asteroid. We helped develop some of the tools um, that, that the crew might use. And then there's a couple of engineers there that actually went and, and used a 3D printing and and machining to actually build build some tools, kind of representative of, of what we think. Um, astronauts would have on the surfaces of these bodies. So it's, it's kind of exciting to be a part of that, and it's uh, definitely different than anything I've done before. So if you'll hopefully see this in the news in the next couple of weeks as they're down there doing their research. Okay, and so I said I would tell you what two weeks in a box means. So um, basically, uh, as a postdoc, you have flexibility, so you're not necessarily funded to do one thing in particular. In general, you're just kind of funded. So if your advisor is nice enough, you can spend your time doing random projects. So there was a, basically they were looking for volunteers for a, a two-week study inside of this, this habitat here. It's called HERA, which is a human exploration research analog. Um, so you had the qualifications, you had to have some sort of advanced degree in engineering or science. Um, and you had to have two weeks free where you could go overnight, com completely you stay for 14 days locked up with uh, three other people in this habitat. So it's 150 cubic meters. Um, so I, I signed up, I was selected. I actually got to be commander of the mission, which was kind of exciting. And uh, it, was, it was me and three guys, so I, I think maybe they, they wanted to, to look at the psychological aspects of putting a lady in charge of, of three guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, most of the, the, the research um, scientists studying this, uh, this study are um, psychologists and behavioral scientists. So it's a lot more about, you know, what does isolation do to you? What, you know, they did a lot of, they played a lot of games with us. They did a lot of, of psychological stuff on us to, to understand how you handle stress and, and that sort of thing. Um, so this is kind of the mission patch that we developed. So we actually had two doctors on our, our team, two medical doctors, which was exciting. So that's why we put the medical staff there on, on the logo. And then two aerospace engineers, myself and another from Johnson Space Center. Um, and then that's where all of us are from. So. I just put up a couple pictures. This, this actually shows all the different equipment that, that we were wearing. So they had uh, 14 cameras watching us at all times. So they had nine, um, they had four high definition cameras, very high definition we, we saw later. And then, um, <laughs> and then uh, nine other cameras. And, and pretty much they could see you um, anywhere. They said they were always watching us because of course safety is, is a big thing there. And we were human test subjects for two weeks. So, um, so we, we wore uh, heart rate monitors, we wore, um, uh, a badge around our neck that, that showed where we were relative to everyone else. Um, so one of the things they were interested in is how were we interacting with each other, um, how close were we to each other, and, you know, on day 10 were we standing further apart when we had conversations, that, that sort of thing. Um, so, um, and we had headsets to communicate with mission control, so you couldn't talk with anyone during this time except mission control. Um, and this was a picture, we, we all tried to take this picture to make it look like we were floating, but we did have gravity. I do get that question a lot though, but. <laughs> Um, so here's just a few of the pictures of stuff that we did inside. So we did a lot of um, uh, medical operations, so we actually got to uh, learn how to do ultrasounds on each other, uh, which was exciting, especially for those of us who weren't doctors, medical doctors. Um, so uh, that's us doing another medical simulation, um, a lot of emergency simulations. We did uh, rover assembly, we, we built a robot, and um, uh, we did analysis of uh, meteorites with a microscope. And the coolest thing, I think, was actually we got to fly a simulator. Um, basically, it's a, the same asteroid simulator that they use to train the astronauts. And so the days that we did this, they actually had people come in on the outside of mission control and operate this, this uh, software for us. So that was, that was really exciting. So that was my favorite part. Uh, so again, just a couple more pictures of us hanging around. There's our, our bunks. We basically had a, each had a little bunk that was uh, the size of a twin mattress. 
Um, so it was two stories. So the, the bottom story was where we did all the, the um, research type stuff and, and analysis and experiments. And then the top floor was exercise and then the kitchen. And then right above that was the kind of a little loft where we had all of our bunks. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it for, for this study. It's, it's really interesting. There's a lot I can't talk about um, because they don't want to ruin it for future test subjects. But if any of you are interested, I think you have to be between like 26 and, and 50 and in good health and you have to have an advanced degree. So um, if anyone's interested, come talk to me. They're always looking for volunteers. And next year, uh, two weeks is going to turn into 30 days. And the year after that, it's going to turn into 60 days. So I think that it's good I did it when, when I did. <laughs> and I keep in touch with all these guys, too, by the way. So it went well. It was successful. So I was going to show a video, but I'm going to skip that. But if anyone's interested, I've got it on my laptop. I can show you a little tour of the, the facility where we stayed, in case you're interested in, in living there for a couple of weeks. Um, OK, so I love this quote because it's, it's so true. So as I said, for a postdoc, you're, you kind of have some flexibility. So I, as you've kind of seen, I work on a bunch of different stuff. And the last few charts here, which I'll go over quickly, um, is basically uh, you know, a couple other projects that I'm interested in and, and have spent some amount of time working on. Um, but that's why I really, really like being a postdoc. I get to kind of do what interests me, as long as my advisor is OK with that. Um, OK, so again, mission concept development is a big thing. We have a lot of meetings where we just sit and think of ideas, which I think is really cool that we get to do that. Um, I'm really interested in CubeSats. So I see a bunch of the other NASA centers getting really involved. So CubeSats are basically 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Um, and you can set them up real cheap. Usually, you can get a free ride into space. Um, and it's becoming a big thing. And so I'm trying to get our center more involved in that. Um, and I'm always looking for ideas. So again, if anyone has ideas on, on some sort of experiment that would be interesting um, you know, in your industry, let me know. Because I think there's always potential for, for stuff that we just haven't thought of. Um, and then this is just, I won't go over this, but this was just a, a concept that our team had come up with. And I kind of put a, spent some time kind of studying this, this idea um, if, that we could use CubeSats or SmallSats to basically go to the L4, L5 Lagrange points, uh, where we know for sure there's one Trojan asteroid sitting there. Um, and go look for others. Basically, just send a, a, a small sat with, with a camera and look around and try and find more Trojan asteroids, which I think would be really cool. So again, no funding for this, but if you have a few million dollars, I'll take it and go do this. <laughs> um, so another thing I kind of put together when I got there, I didn't know a ton about asteroids or asteroid science. So I put together, um, just interviewing some, some different crew members and then scientists and engineers, a list of what kind of science do we want to do um, on an asteroid, and what kind of instruments are there to do that? So there's a lot of instrumentation. Uh, a lot of these things, you guys are probably more familiar with the technology than I am, uh, but I'm trying to learn as much as I can. Um, and this is just kind of a summary of, of what have we done on asteroid surfaces and kind of my propaganda for why we need to, to go to asteroids to study more. So this is kind of what, what we've done and what we have planned. Um, and that's over two decades, so that's it's not a lot, really. Um, and we've only actually visited the surface of two asteroids. Um, and most of these things have been you know, ground observations, rendezvous, flybys. But I really think we need to go to the surface to study, to study asteroids. Uh, so this is kind of why I think we need, we need to do that. So hopefully you'll believe me. Um, and kind of to tie everything back together, so in grad school I studied strength of tantalum and strength of iron. Um, and so one thing I'm trying to get involved in when I have time is to do strength of meteorites. So that's something that no one at my lab is doing and very few people in the country are working on. So I'm interested um, in studying the strength of, of ordinary chondrites and carbonaceous chondrites. So I've actually been granted a, a big chunk of an ordinary chondrite. Um, and I have a machine. It's not actually that one. I don't have a picture of it um, that in the lab that, I, that no one's using because no one does this sort of thing at Johnson Space Center. So I'm going to start doing investigations studying the strength of meteorites. Um, and hopefully that, that will lead to some more research. And, and hopefully then we'll come up with some of these material properties that people like Paul Miller can use in, in the models that they use to, to understand these bodies. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much.